On October 23, 1918, Meyer Lansky was 16 years old. His parents were Russian Jewish immigrants who heard of a promised land known as America and longed to raise their children in this land of opportunity. Meyer's prospects looked hopeful. He completed the eighth grade with honors and became an apprentice tool and die maker. He was known as a hard worker and was rarely seen without a book in his hands. But just 24 hours later, that would all change. On his way home from work on the evening of October 24th, Lansky heard a woman scream. He ran in the direction of the woman's call for help to find two men standing over a completely nude woman. The woman was a prostitute and she was giving a handsome young neighborhood Jewish boy, Ben Siegel, a freebie. When her pimp found out, he threw the woman on the ground and began kicking her. The melee ended with the pimp getting hit upside the head with a monkey wrench from Lansky's toolbox, which sent the now bewildered pimp reeling backwards. Just then, several police officers rushed into the building and subdued the lot of them. Lansky was charged with felonious assault when appearing before Judge McAdoo and was discharged when the pimp refused to press charges. As Lansky walked from the court, the pimp introduced himself as Salvatore Lucania. He would later become known as Charles Lucky Luciano. This is just one of the numerous stories which tell how Meyer Lansky and Charlie Luciano met and became friends. Many believe the tale has a little truth mixed with a lot of error, but it makes little difference. However they met, and whichever story is true, one thing is for certain. A friendship was forged thereafter between Meyer Lansky and Charlie Luciano that lasted their lifetime. So just who was Meyer Lansky? Mayor Suchaljansky was born in 1902 in Grodno, Russia. His parents, Max and Yetta, named him after a historic rabbi. Early childhood records, including an enrollment card in PS84, showed Meyer Lansky was born August 28, 1902. However, the family always celebrated his birthday on July 4th and recognized July 4th, 1902 as his day of birth. At some point after meeting Charlie Lucky, Meyer quit his apprenticeship and began formulating different rackets with his newfound friend. One of their dreams was a syndicate of different gangs coming under the umbrella of a board of directors. They spoke of it often and made plans for the future. Luciano went to work for a mafia powerhouse named Joe Masseria, who fancied himself the boss. Lansky, with the help of Ben Siegel, who Meyer often noted wasn't all there, organized a floating crap game. Together they ran the Bugs and Meyer mob, an extremely violent street game. The duo became so successful with their illegal gambling racket that they were soon taken under the wing of Jacob Little Augie Organ. After the passage of Prohibition and the subsequent Volstead Act in 1920, Lansky and Siegel branched out into bootlegging and hijacking competitors' liquor shipments. Due to Lansky's brains and organizational skills, the gang, which now boasted a couple of dozen Jewish mobsters, caught the eye of Mafia chieftain Joe Masseria, Luciano's boss. He brought Lansky and Siegel into the fold, despite both being Jewish. But neither Lansky nor Luciano liked the arrangement. By 1927, and perhaps before, Lansky made the pitch that the uptown gangsters weren't needed. He and Luciano could handle their own business and supply their own muscle. Luciano agreed, stating the old world mafia was outdated. To further their interest of a national syndicate, in 1929 Lansky and Luciano organized the Atlantic City Convention which was attended by such underworld powers as Al Capone, Frank Costello, Joe Adonis, Charles Solomon, Johnny Liza, and Abner Zwillman, just to name a few, all representing the most important cities in America. By the end of the decade, Joe the Boss was locked in a bitter feud with another Mafia chief, Salvatore Maranzano. Knowing this old world feud was none of their business and bad for business to boot, Luciano and Lansky had both Masseria and Maranzano killed in 1931. American Mafia history writes, 
these three men allegedly joined with a number of other prominent mobsters to create a national crime syndicate. The syndicate, as it was known, was essentially a partnership between Italian and Jewish gangsters in the bootlegging trade. After the death of Mazzaria and Maranzano, Lansky knew that many of the Sicilian old-timers still liked the old ways. To keep the peace and win over members of the now-dead Mafia chieftains, Lansky urged Luciano to keep a few of the old world trappings used by the Mustache Peets, a derogatory name the Young Turks gave to those who came directly from Sicily. He agreed, but Luciano had no patience for the nonsense of made men and blood oaths. He did eliminate the position of boss of bosses. At Lansky's suggestion, the organization took the name Unione Siciliano, a corruption in the spelling of the old fraternal organization. Eventually, Luciano just called it the outfit or the combination. But the handwriting was on the wall. Prohibition was a failed experiment and was on its way to being repealed. And just two years after the death of the old guard, Prohibition was over. Lansky shifted his focus from booze to gambling. Unlike other gangsters who often cheated players, Lansky insisted that all his gambling parlors be legitimate. Don't cheat the customer, he would tell his underlings. If you garner a reputation for being fair, more suckers will play, and the odds are always on the house. As a result of Meyer's edict, gambling dens operated by the Bugs and Meyer gang flourished, and the money rolled in. Lansky invested in gaming from Las Vegas to New Orleans, down to Florida and Havana, Cuba. As his wealth increased, so did his influence. Lansky may have been the only Jewish gangster who could order a hit on a made man and not have to justify his action. Carl Syphakis explains, There was a godfather of the National Crime Syndicate, the parent organization of what became the American Mafia, and thus the real godfather of the American Mafia. He was called with total respect the little man, and Luciano's advice to his followers was, always listen to him. It is a record of fact that though he was Jewish, none of the top mafiosi ever excluded Meyer Lansky from any vote of the syndicate. They may disagree with him from time to time, but they always wanted his input and respected his decisions. Martin Ghosh, in his book The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, claims Luciano said to him in an interview, Meyer Lansky, my old partner and a Jew, would wind up the real boss of bosses of all the Italians and Jews. Another time Luciano stated, Meyer Lansky understood the Italian brain almost better than I did. That's why I picked him to be my consigliere, to talk over the best way to handle things. I used to tell Lansky that he may have had a Jewish mother, but that he must have been wet nursed by a Sicilian. Lansky also knew when to listen to reason. He never let power get in the way of money. For example, at the formation of the syndicate, many graduates from the Bugs and Meyer gang were moved into the newly created enforcement arm of the syndicate, the crew that became known as Murder Incorporated. Lansky proposed the enforcers be put under the command of a triumvirate composed of Louis Lepke Bacalter, Albert Anastasia, and Bugsy Siegel. Other leaders of the emerging National Crime Syndicate objected to the Kill Happy Siegel, feeling he would be too loyal to Lansky and would give Lansky too powerful of a hold on the apparatus of the extermination crew. Lansky agreed to drop Siegel from the murder troop. Compromises by Lansky, such as the one stated previously, helped hold the fragile combination together in its early days and aided Lansky in earning the respect of all of its members. By the time World War II arrived in 1941, his old friend Lucky was behind bars on the charge that he ran the nation's largest prostitution ring. But with Lansky's help, he won an early release in a deal with the government. In return, the New York mob, which controlled the docks and shipyards along the waterfront, agreed to report and prevent sabotage by feared Nazi infiltrators. Another opportunity to show his allegiance to his combination partners came at the expense of his boyhood friend, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, and his vision of a gambler's paradise in Las Vegas, Nevada. 
Siegel, who was responsible for the project, was in over his head. Construction costs skyrocketed, and once the hotel and casino opened, it started losing money in record amounts, money invested by many combination notables. Lansky, like the other gangsters, suspected his friend Siegel was skimming money from the casino. To steal from your friends was as low as a person could go in Lansky's eyes. When the board asked if Siegel had to go, Meyer, reluctantly it should be added, voted yes. Lansky, perhaps more than most, understood the importance of being in the shadows. He was never flashy, allowing others to be in the spotlight. One reporter notes that for a 10-year period, Lansky's name was never mentioned in any newspaper or by a newsman, and that was just the way Meyer liked it. For many years afterwards, Lansky lived the life of quiet disguise, running his operations in the United States from Miami Beach while presenting himself as an everyday old man. But in 1970, the government decided to prosecute him for income tax evasion, and he fled to Israel. Sent back to the U.S., Lansky stood trial but was acquitted. He died January 15, 1983 of lung cancer. Some investigators believed he left hundreds of millions of dollars hidden away in secret accounts. But as far as anyone could prove, the mob's money man died almost penniless. And that is probably just what he wanted them to believe.